Okay, so we only have five students here. I don't know where the rest of you are. Um, I, you could write on your post why, you know, what, why you're absent, right? You can write on every post why you were absent that day, if you were. So I can get some kind of ballpark figure. Um, getting uh, seven or eight emails is gonna be a bit much. So if you just uh, tell me on your post, that would be fine. Um, so I think because we have so few, uh, those of you who are listening, uh, might not be prepared, that might be why. But what I'll do is I'll have each person present first their research paper, and then I'll ask every other person in the class to ask her a question or make a comment so that we can have a meaningful conversation. And then maybe that will trigger something, inspire somebody who's listening to the video to think about what they want to write or what they would like to add to what they have. Um, so let me start with Ramisha. Um, so what did you write for your research paper? Okay. Hello, Professor. Hi. So, um, I did, uh, hello everyone, and uh, good morning all of you. Uh, I did my research about coral reefs in Sri Lanka. So uh, my research topic is coral reef degradation in Sri Lankan sea. Uh, so uh, this is my introduction part. Uh, coral reefs are an invaluable resource in the ecosystem and it is an aquatic habitat characterized by reef forming corals. So uh, coral reefs are formed over a lengthy period of time. Uh, actually, I choose uh, this topic because uh, Sri Lanka is an island. So coral reefs are a valuable resource which we should protect. Hence, uh, in uh, this research paper, I discuss like the human activities that contribute to uh, coral reef degradation as well as the actions uh, that must be implemented to conserve the coral reefs. Uh, so, uh, 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 there are a variety of factors that contribute to the uh, deterioration of coral reefs in Sri Lanka. Uh, the first one is destructive, destructive fishing and coral mining, uh, over harvesting, unplanned development, sedimentation and pollution. So in the research paper, I have discussed those factors. Uh, also, uh, I have given some solutions and alternatives alternatives to uh, safeguard Sri Lankan's coral reef. Uh, basically, I think uh, since humans are uh, uh, no directly involved in the destruction of coral reefs, so I think humans are also the only ones who can implement uh, coral reef protection methods. So I think uh, first and uh, mainly, I believe the government and environmental organization should conduct uh, programs to raise public awareness of coral reefs, risk factors and solutions for their conservation. Uh, in addition, uh, strict laws and uh, regulations for coral mining and destructive uh, fishing should be uh, enacted by the government. Uh, also, I think, uh, Official procedures uh, should be created in such places for the uh, appropriate disposal of trash for local and international visitors visiting coral reefs and uh, harsh penalties should be enforced on uh, tourists who do not properly dispose of rubbish. Uh, finally, I think as humans, uh, it is our uh, 
responsibility to protect this amazing creation around the country because uh, it is so beneficial to man and the environment. So this is my research. Thank you so much. All right, Romisha, were you aware of this before you took this class? Did you know about no. it? No, no, Professor, I didn't know about it. So I did some research about this topic. Then I found some information about it. Were you surprised at how? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, because uh, I didn't know that uh, coral is uh, using for some uh, production. So I didn't know about it. But after I researched this, uh, I knew about it. Okay. Um, do you are you aware of how many people are making how much money or if these people are influencing political campaigns or um you know lobbying politicians did you do any research on that uh i didn't do professor but i think with, uh, many uh for some uh, economic sectors i think they uh, get some income from these uh, corals, like uh, right. for some industries and for some uh, uh, fish industry as well. Uh, yeah, the thing is, maybe in Sri Lanka, they're really small, you know, yeah. just really small farmers or small coral reef. It's an individual rather than a big corporation like everything is in the U.S. Yeah, um, yeah. But then it would be really hard for the government to regulate, right? The informal economy. Does that make sense? Yeah, yes, Professor, yes. Okay. Okay, somebody else should make a comment or have a question. Um, Sauda, do you want to ask Ramisha something? Uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Good night. Uh, so for Ramisha, well, I was thinking, uh, does your research concentrate on any like places or location on Sri Lanka specifically? Or like, uh, do you know? Yes, because for me, uh, whenever I read about coral research, it's uh, usually not in Asia. So I was wondering, how you got interested and if there's any uh, coral reef in Sri Lanka? I just only focus in on Sri Lankan coastal area, not any other areas. Is there a, is there a website that's uh, focused on coral reefs throughout the world so that Sauda could find something about Bangladesh? Oh, no, Professor, actually I uh, got information only from the scholarly articles. And uh, so I did research only about uh, my Sri Lankan uh, uh, coastal area, not the world. That okay, no, I no, have. that was, that's okay. I just didn't know mm -hmm. if uh, there's some central site or if you just have to, you know, Google in the specific, each country is specific and um, that's where you got it. You got it from that. Um, so that's fine. That's good. It's good to know. Yeah, I don't think there's any website, Professor Atlas. I don't know of any about specifically corals. But for Bangladesh, I know like we have uh, a coral island, uh, St. Martin. And I remember going there when I was little and I so, like I've seen them in with my own eyes and I even got like cats from the corals as well They're just playing in the ocean so though that's like a vivid memory for me from my childhood but I don't know it's been like so long I'm like an adult now so I don't know what I would see if I go back to the ocean like St. Martin now what would be the state of the ocean and the corals because it's been so long and so much has changed the in terms of in terms of climates and 
everything the tour and the tourism i always hear and see the news about all of the destruction and the uh, pollution in st martin but i don't know maybe seeing it in my own eyes it would probably hit a lot, lot harder the biggest issue is probably the warming of the world's oceans because that'll just kill off everything you know um, and that's the reason the oceans are warming is because the air is hotter and the oceans are absorbing the heat um that's why climate change hasn't been as severe as some models had been predicting before is that the oceans are really absorbing it but of course there's a price to pay for that um can i tell you a funny story about my own <laughs> coral yes, <please. laughs> all right so this is the weird professor with her funny story okay so i was in indonesia and i went to oh some island that had you know well-known coral reefs and i didn't learn how to scuba dive there were people in the boat that i was in that that went and scuba dive but i just did the little snorkel thing you know and then another day i was walking along and i just thought i'll just walk over here and put my snorkel on and see if i see some coral you know so I did, and it was gorgeous, and I was just watching. It was like, oh, it was so beautiful. And then th the corals were getting closer and closer. <laughs> and then I realized, oh, my God, the tide is going out. And the stuff is <laughs> – and it is like it cuts you, right? It's, it's hard. And so the stuff is coming closer and closer to me. And I thought, yeah, it's beautiful, but I got to get out of here. So um, I don't know, it's such a typical tourist, idiot tourist kind of thing that happens. You don't check when the tide goes out, you know? So that's my story. Um, but it's fun to say, like you remembered it this to this day, so. <laughs> well, the corals are gorgeous, I'm not, I don't ever say anymore, I'll never forget it. It's just like, I'm not gonna forget it until my brain cells really go. <laughs> Pretty vivid memory. It's so gorgeous, right? How many of you, you saw coral reef soda? Yes, professor. Like not uh, in scuba diving or deep dive, just uh, on the beach and like, just playing on the ocean so in uh saint martin there's like the whole beach is like kind of surrounded with coral reefs so they small or big i mean the water was really clear so you could see oh, where oh. you're going and the, see the uh, corals and you know it was easy to avoid them but like i was a kid so i didn't listen or uh, like look for anything i was just running around and Got myself on like hard corals a lot of the yeah. time. Well, so have the others, have you all snorkeled or scuba dived? Or you probably haven't scuba dived. It's kind of pricey to pay for that. Um, but have any of you snorkeled? Any of the rest of you? No, because I hate water. I love by the water, but I don't know how to swim. Aww. So that's why I've never done it. Like when I was in Australia, my host pa family like wants me to do it, but I just don't have the courage to try it. Like, oh, that's true. I'm afraid of water, so yeah. And Professor, it's like my family is exactly opposite to Racy's. <laughs> I wanted to try scuba diving uh, once we went to Indonesia. So I yeah. really wanted to try scuba diving because they are they, that is very popular there. So, but my family was very <laughs> afraid and they didn't let me do it. Yeah. What about you, Jamie? Yeah, it depends upon what country you live in. I don't think Afghanistan probably has a lot of scuba dive. <laughs> okay, so let's move. Oh, Sristi, do you have a question for Ramisha? Uh, no, Professor. Or comment? Did you know about the deterioration of the coral? 
No, professor. I actually didn't know about anything. Okay. okay. Jamie, do you have a question or a comment? No, professor. Okay. What about you, Rasi? I, I don't have a question. I just want to say that um, researching about coral reefs is really important because coral bleaching and all the um, ocean acidification is really harmful. And so at least it helps to open our eyes to what's going on. And we, to a certain extent, can also take part in making a difference. You might think that now it's impossible, but if we look in the future, we'll be among the educated. And so I believe that we can take actions to the issues that we're seeing. So it's a good choice. I, there are so many people absent that I think I might ask the rest of the students to do a separate one because there's so much that when you collectively write, each student writes about something. I mean, by the end of the class, we've all learned so much. So maybe uh, those of you who are listening, I'm gonna try to get you into another situation where you present on your papers. Um, so Saristi, what did you have for your research paper? Professor, uh, can I just ask one, one more question too? Sure, of course. Yeah. Uh, Ramisha, so uh, this might be like a really ignorant question, but I just wanted to ask. So for me, like, uh, do you have any specific location or like a name for me I can look up about the corals in Sri Lanka? Because for me, whenever I think of Sri Lanka, <laughs> I never imagine ocean <laughs> or corals at yeah, all. Yeah. Uh in my mind it's always like mountains and like greens and like uh temples and all of that never imagined world. so, so, so uh, yeah if she has her paper done you can also send it to me in an email and i'll just forward it to everyone in the class <laughs> right okay and have the references is that okay sweetie uh, so yeah. Is that okay? Well, that's... And then the references will be in the paper. I think she's asking you, Ramesha, if she can send it to us. Your permission. So I'll send Professor. So you can forward it to Savda. Yeah, okay. I was okay. okay. I know you I have know. to post it. You have to post it on the um the Google Classroom, but if you don't mind, if you send it to me in an email, I can forward it to everyone in the class because they might all be interested. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yes, probably. Okay. All right, good. Um, Sristi, let's see. Did you have your... Uh, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Should, should I should start? Yep. Okay, um, thank you everyone. Um, so today I'm going to present about uh, the, economical, uh, the economical growth and the climate change of Bangladesh. Uh, so Bangladesh has made an, such an extraordinary progress in economic development that it has lately joined the world's developing countries recently. So it has made a significant success in the country's long-term economic growth by creating a number of export items and also expanding the business, the factories, and, and that even helped in lowering the, lowering the poverty in Bangladesh recently. Uh, but uh, however, despite everything, um, Bangladesh has become noticeably vulnerable to climate changes issues, and it has resulted in several economic difficulties such as food security, reduced agricultural output, or and so on. So similarly, economic growth has dep depleted natural resources that created population and even resulted in biodiversity loss. So my thesis is on to save life on lives on Earth while simultaneously allowing the economy to thrive, economic development sectors should 
establish a greener strategy that includes sustainable agriculture and waste minimization, regardless of capitalist perspective on economic growth. As a result, Bangladesh's economy and ecology will both benefit. So my first uh, argument is on minimizing the industrial waste that will benefit both the environment and the economy. And the second argument is on the promotion of sustainable agriculture in Bangladesh that would play an important role in both the economy and climate change issue. So for my first argument, um, to minimize the industrial waste, uh, like the government does have some policies on this waste management system, but these are not implemented well. Uh, as we know, um, like the river Buriganga and many other rivers are being really uh, toxically polluted from the um, polluted by the industrial areas and that industrial waste has been a very toxic and um, the solid and liquid waste has been very toxic to pollute the water of the, um, the important rivers of the country and it like the 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 companies and the other and the governmental organizations doesn't have a proper solution for that so these are like not implemented very well and even if they have these are not implemented very very well so if the country the economy develops the waste uh, should be managed and reduced well first otherwise this can bring threats for the environment and it will speed up the economic process the climate change process for for bangladesh so in this case companies are helping the economy of the country to grow by destroying the environment as well if they continue this so company and companies and factory owners need to come up with an alternative solution for the environment as an in as an environmental friendly solution that can be beneficial to both the economy and the climate together and for my second argument the promotion of sustainable agriculture in bangladesh the necessity of it includes um the, pro pro the promotion of sustainable agriculture in Bangladesh uh, is a necessity that includes the increasing farm profitability, promoting environmental stewardship, such as protecting and improving so soil quality, uh, reducing reliance on non renewable resources like fuel and synth synthetic fertilizers and pesticides, and minimizing negative impacts on safety, wildlife, and other environmental resources and minimizing biodiversity loss and agricultural genetic diversity. These, produce, these procedures disclose the use of toxic fertilizers to increase the production by harming the lands and in, instead will improve the lands for many crops harvesting. So it also includes um, using um, biodegradable fertilizers that only can be recycled from cow dung and other animal waste. So my previous argument is also making an indirect connection to the idea of sustainable uh, agriculture process. Nonetheless, like as it is an environmental friendly way of harvesting, it also adds more profits to the agricultural industry by enriching the lands that will bring benefits for the industry and other company owners, the economic sectors in Bangladesh. And Finally, like my study focuses on the environmental friendly economy development of Bangladesh. So if factory owners consider zero waste or minimizing waste to make their business greener and also the and produce less hazardous waste, uh, by default, it will protect the environment and control the climate change as well. Also considering the sustainable agriculture, it, it is important to increase the environmental stability as well as keeping the um, keeping the economy growth balanced. So I think this paper is important for both the economic conscious non-governmental organizations and also the powerful industry owners and factory developers in, in Bangladesh as they will be the decision, decision makers for our country, economy and environment. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Professor. All right. Um... Ramisha, do you have a question or a comment? Uh, I don't have a question, but I will say something about her research. So I think uh, she has find a, uh, found a good topic. And she mentioned about the sustainable agriculture as her uh, one argument. So I think it's a 
uh, good choice and in Sri Lanka as well uh, uh, in uh, the government also doing some uh, program about the sustainable agriculture uh, they are minimizing uh, you know uh, chemical uh, chemical fertilizers uh, and uh, they introduce some uh, organic uh, fertilizers to uh, agricultural field so I think it's a, a good way to uh, you know uh, uh, minimize uh, uh, environmental problems. So that's a good thing uh, which uh, Shistri has mentioned. Yeah. Okay, Jamie, do you have a comment or a question? Uh... Professor, um, uh... I don't understand that she mentioned argument one, argument two. Well, one is minimizing industrial waste. And the second one was promoting sustainable agriculture. Jamie, can you specifically, um, specifically say like which one did you, you didn't understand? So I will specify again. Okay, uh, I guess we'll move on. Um, Saudat, do you have a question or a comment? Uh, uh, not a questions, but like, I was just thinking, this is a really good topic and and it is like uh, when I was uh, listening to uh, Shristi, I was thinking like this is really, really good direction for us. Uh, but, you know, when I think about Bangladesh, I think for a while in our country, there was like this craze about uh, artificial, uh, not even, I mean, just just the artificial agriculture is just using uh, lab-based uh, seeds and everything and using uh, insecticides on pills and stuff. So it was like, I think it was really common and, you know, just it was seen as uh, science and advancement for us. And it was like, but now we know that it's really bad for the environment. But before it was just right, like really a, almost a trend for everyone to use insecticides and uh, chemicals in fields. So although now I, I think, I guess it's because of the economy and everything, it kind of went down a little bit because the, it's expensive and farmers can't afford it at times. So the use is kind of a lot lesser now. And I there's also like government also did like a huge campaign about biogas and the use of uh, natural uh, fertilizers. So, I mean, we are still using insecticide, but at least in the fertilizer fertilizer sites we are using I mean it's encouraged to use more natural uh, fertilizers so I remember watching well this is like a while back ago years ago but I remember on tv there would always be like campaigns like uh, dramas short dramas or just the documentaries or just an advertisement about how biogas is really good for you and how uh, farmers and everyone can use their waste from their kitchen and from their cows uh, cows uh, and like even from their fields all of the leftover uh, roots and everything they can take them out uh, from the field and instead of throwing that away combine all of that waste into biogas the plant and it can you know uh, they can get fertilizers from it and they can also get uh, gases uh, for like fuel for cooking and it can even uh, somehow uh, give you electricity as well I don't know it was like 
I don't really exactly remember, but they, they introduced a whole system that you can install in your home and you can uh, without like not free of cost, but without really cheap cost, you can get fertilizers, you can get uh, uh, gas for cooking and even electricity at your home. And it was like really advertised and really recommended to farmers a lot. And I think government was also uh, helping people install biogas plants in their home, small biogas plants, and even like homemade, it's like makeshift biogas, not like nothing fancy, but they can, how they can utilize it even on their own. I think they, they were like making, they showed uh, they have to make a big hole in the ground and like the whole process of how they can turn the waste into biogas and fertilizer. So that was, I think, like a really good campaign for us. But I don't know, that was like a long time ago. I have no idea what our like agricultural side does nowadays. Yeah, uh, I, will, they, I would like to add to Sauda here, like I have also heard about this biogas thing, like years ago when we were in school and very um, little. So it yeah. was like, there was a thing, yeah, it was very strong um, promotion that time in the TVs and everything. But after like some months, it has also like disappeared and no one ever talked about uh, it again. And then the same process again came and people again never stopped using these um, fertilizers and artificial and toxic chemicals on ag agricultural purposes so it was like in Bangladesh the government sometimes they try to bring um, environmental friendly solutions in the businesses and other purposes but um, I, th I think there is a other other part, um, uh, the company owners and whatever uh, the ha powerful people in the who are connected to the government or maybe who has um, a lot of power in this country, like I think they have a this role to um, disappear the environmental friendly uh, solutions from the country and uh, to again involve people in convincing to do the use the this uh their to this toxic ways and other ways to us uh, like to go with their businesses yeah it's yeah i mean you wonder the corporations that make money right on the toxic stuff are huge international corporations so yes, yes. they would not want to compete against the local yokel sustainability it's just terrible to make it into this economic calculation so that goes back to francis bacon right knowledge is power and it goes back to john locke i deserve whatever i can sell at a profit you know so um yeah it's it's sad right remember the guy who said what has posterity ever done for me so we have this whole economy with no concern for the future, right? To be rational is to calculate your own economic self-interest. So they can, they come in there and do this stuff to get rid of the, the biogas uh, technique. And they do it in the name of the good, right? They really convince themselves. That's what really annoys me, that that's rational. Uh, does everybody understand that, you know, the philosophical sort of context for all of this? Yes, Professor. Anyway, that's a, a good topic. And anybody else want to ask Risi Rossi? Not really. Um, the problems that she discussed are actually quite similar to what I've also been researching related to my um, research paper too. So, yeah. Okay. Kanij, do you have a question or a comment for Sristi? Uh, well, uh, he mentions the first one was uh, agricultural, uh, sorry. And the second one was uh, if, we, if we like uh, try to 
could manage up dust in industries and factories. But um, my question is like, um, it's, 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 it's really important for the environment to, you know, to take care of the trash and it's also keep our environment uh, well if we put industrial dust in a good place. But, but industry, it's, it's, it's really big, it, it's really huge and a factory also. So um, can, we, can you tell me that um, how we can do that? Like um, it's a huge dust. So of course we need a, a specific place or specific things to put that uh, dust in somewhere. But uh, yes, honestly, um, no one did that. In, Yes, yeah, yeah. so that's why like I have talked about the promotion strategy because uh, I have also talked about like we need promotions from all the NGOs in the country and all the non-governmental and also the governmental uh, um, organizations and also the public because a public who are like very... Uh, um, who needs to educate first about like how why environment is very important to us and then how it is uh, harming the and like uh, harming our nature and the industrial waste and everything and uh, now they like people are like blind to the development of our country because uh, as bangladesh has been has been a had been a uh, underdeveloped country for a long, long time, and recently it has re like reached the developing countries of the world. So people have become very happy, and of course it's a great thing. But um, the way it has been um, running for years, the economical strategies of our country, uh, if uh, they are like still want to continue it, as Bangladesh has been reaching to its peak, so. Uh, like it is really hard, like hard for Bangladesh, I think for Bangladesh's government to convince people in doing like change their, the ways they are, they have been doing this uh, economical um, businesses, especially the company owners and everyone. So our target should have to be at first the company owners to convince them like uh, you, the ways you are doing, you are actually not building the Bangladesh's future, but you are ruining the country's future. So like the environment will, if you destroy the environment to bring to bring our business for good, so it will never bring good for the future. So uh, we need to convince them by, um, noticing uh, by telling them these facts over and over and if the public also responses to that uh, the, most of the organizations responses to that I think they won't be able to um, there haven't been this kind of a big movements as till now in our country but if we can make uh, make it happen so I think it will some it will help in reducing at some point at least that's why I have talked about reducing not completely disappearing Okay, um, so we have, we're still in the old paradigm, right? We're still in that modern paradigm of knowledge and rationality. And we do need to make this huge shift, right? Paradigm yeah. shift, a whole different view of reality and culture. And so, yeah, it's big. So um, I do think it's interesting, you know, the more students report it's the same in every country, right? Coral reefs, industrial waste, sustainable agriculture. You know, there's going to be this long list, and the students from the different countries, right? Their coral reefs might not be an issue in Afghanistan, but um, there's this there the problem of the modern paradigm and the need for a paradigm shift. That'll probably a pro be a problem. Plus the uh, colonialism, right? That was the modern paradigm was during the era of colonialism. And so we still have uh, a lot of colonial mentality. Like we, we know better than you, right? We have science, we have technology, we have progress and there's this linear progress. And don't, you know, just imitate us or want to be like us. And that we just need to shift the paradigm. Um, that okay, Sristi? 
Yes, Professor. Okay, very good. Uh, Rossi, why don't you go? Okay, so my research paper is titled Save Our Lake, Save Our Life. So in Cambodia, there is the Tenle Sap Lake. It's one of the biggest freshwater lake in Cambodia. And it holds a lot of freshwater species and a variety of water birds. However, it's been damaged due to various reasons. So this essay will explore how overfishing, untreated industrial and domestic sewage and hydropower projects upstream lead to the reduction in biodiversity in the Tunle Sap Lake and what students, the community and the government can do to save the ecosystem. And then I talk for, so my essay is separated into two parts. First of all, I talk about overfishing and the use of illegal fishing tools, as well as corruption within the um, ministry. And then I talk about how people at all levels can get involved to make a difference, starting with awareness campaigns led by students, to workshops by NGOs, and to um, talking about how government officials need to strictly implement the illegal fishing ban in areas by severely punish, uh, punishing bribery and um, cease the sales of illegal fishing nets. Then I talk about the other main issue, which is the deposit of untreated industrial and domestic sewage waste. Since there's very few sewage treatments in Cambodia, a lot of these waste gets dumped into rivers, which ended up in our Tenle Sap Lake. And in Siem Reap, it's a province bordering the Tunle Sap Lake. So there's been a lot of incidences about poisonous fish and people dying from um, incidences of eating fish from the Tunle Sap Lake. And they have seen poison within um, those who have died. And then I talk about actions that needs to be taken to handle the untreated industrial and domestic sewage by talking about how people need to acknowledge the dangers and then a huge fund needs to be um, diverted to creating um, better water treatments and sewage system. And also I talk about how during the dry season, they shouldn't intensify the agricultural practices on the lake border where they cut down the mango trees and burn the shrubs. So NGOs should um, should educate the people to limit the agricultural um, practices along the lake borders. And then the Ministry of Environment should conduct more testing and monitor the treated wastewater to ensure that there will be no harm done to the living organisms there. And lastly, I discuss about the hydro projects in China and lower Mekong basins, which interfered with the aquatic life in the Tunle Sap Lake. Um, there's one specific dam that has caused a major impact on the biodiversity in the Tunle Sap Lake. And it is the Lankang dams. And this caused the Mekong century low levels of water and it in turn impact the late reversal of the Tunde Sap Lake and causing droughts in the last few years. And because of this low reduction, oh, because of this late reversal, there's a low reduction in sediment deposits, which harm the spawning and breeding of fish and amphibians, leading to a reduction in biodiversity and aquatic life. And so I talk about the solutions that the issue of hydropower projects needs to be addressed at a regional level with the involvement of countries like China, Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, and Cambodia. And these countries need to come up with a proper regional water management plan that will not allow any one country to exploit their segment of the Mekong River because since Cambodia is at the bottom, we face the most damages and get the least like benefits from these dams. 
And then I sum up how the biodiversity of the Tunle Sap Lake is threatened because of the three main reasons mentioned above and how every, it's everyone's involvement and cooperation to change their behaviors and call for the actions that will save the ecosystem. And students and local need to be aware of what is going on in the Tunle Sap Lake and participate in events that promote the protection of this aquatic life. And I end that everyone has the power to make a difference to save our lake and our lives in the future. Very good. Okay. Now, Sristi, comment or question? Uh, yeah, Professor. So the comment is like, I I also have the similarity with Racy, like especially in the pollution or water pollution purpose. Like I have talked about the environment pollution, but I have given the example of like the water pollution in uh, the rivers because of the waste management, the problem. So uh, like, yeah, uh, she talked about how the fishes has been poisoned and people has been dying. So there was also this, this kind of case some years ago in Bangladesh and like people had been dying eating poisonous fish from the rivers and it was like, uh, it is obvious because the people who especially live under the poverty line has been eating even the water. They have been drinking the water from these rivers, especially the Puriganga River in Dhaka, which is like the dirtiest river in the country right now. So yeah, like that it is very concerning. Like um, it is a, about a lake in Resi's um, paper, but in my paper, it's like oh, almost a lot of rivers in Bangladesh and it's huge. And I, I really expect um, like in, in many years, not very recently, but in many years, this problem should be fixed. Okay, so again, we see the same themes coming up in every country, right? Every developing country. Yes. Because they're all interrelated. Um, yeah. Anybody, let's see. Um, Kanij, do you have a comment or a question? Well, um, I think uh, I don't have any questions. I'm, I'm, I'm really clear about the concept, yeah. Okay, Ramisha, do you have a question or a comment? Uh, no question, Professor, but I think uh, it's a good choice of a topic and uh, she has structured it very well, yeah. Okay, what about you, Sauda? Hi, yes, Professor. Uh, Arasi, uh, so I have a question, uh, which is like the dams you uh, talked about, is it located in uh, your country or? Yes, it's in Cambodia. But it's built by the Chinese? Um, yes, so the dams, um, so the Mekong River runs through China, Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, and Cambodia, and there are dams being built by the Chinese in the Lankan area, that's like um, lower China, um, closer to um, Laos, and that is like one of like the largest dam um, construction project, and they're already up and running. And there's like a series of elephant dams in that area, which blocks the water flow. And so that means that the Mekong River, like down, downstream is lower. And usually the Tonle Sap Lake and the Mekong River is interconnected. So at each year, there's like a reversal flow where the sediments are pushed up uh, from the Mekong River up to the Tunle Sap Lake, but since the water level is so low, the sediments uh, are not pushed up and the reversal flow is late and that interferes with the biodiversity in the Tunle Sap Lake. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, so, it's, uh, so the dams, uh, it kind of, since if it's, if it's closer to Laos, it, it it does affect like both countries, right? Yes. And uh, like who is controlling, who, do, who has the control of the dams? Cambodian government or? No, um, so 
each country, the five countries that I have listed, they each have control yeah. over the segment of the Mekong River that runs through their country. So China has control over the dams that are within their um, borders. So, I mean, I mean, they decide how to, so China decides how they, how to use the dams and when to open or close it? Yes. And that's, um, and that's why I was asking for like, the issue needs to be addressed at a regional level where there needs to be a consensus between the five countries in terms of having a proper regional water management plan. And there's like a safeguards to manage the effects on downstream countries because like upper countries have an advantage here with the dams while the lower countries yeah. are at a disadvantage. So like all five countries need to come together to get to a consensus on how to manage these dams, even though China builds them, but like other four countries are affected by these these dams, so they need to raise their opinion, like raise their voice up and do something about it. Yeah, exactly. It's wow, it's kind of messed up. Like, how? I mean, it's not even in China. China doesn't get affected by any of it. So, why do they get to decide how the dams would be used? And because the affected people are Cambodians and Lao and other poor countries you mentioned, right? So yeah. why would, like, just because they built it, they get uh, authority over it? I mean, is that even legal? They can, they can build it, yeah. Uh, we can get developers from other countries and stuff, but how do they get authority over something so important in another country? Well, it's Soda, just, yeah. Soda go back to John Locke's view of property rights, right? They worked hard, they built their dam, they get the fruit of their labor. Um, so that model is still what we have with us. And the reality of environmental problems does not fit that model, but we still are running in this old fashioned, totally worthless way of thinking and then way of running an economy. Does that make sense, Soda? Yeah, Professor, but like it, it, it all, I mean, I can see it, but it's just hard to believe in. I mean. Yeah, wow. it's insane, it's insane. And the reason I like teaching this class is at least it answers that question, right? Otherwise you just say, this is insane. Like what's going on? Yeah. Um, I mean, like, uh, it's kind of when she was talking about them, I kind of I thought, wow, it's similar to us. Like we have issues with India about dams as well. And Bangladesh gets really badly affected by the dams that India built. Because since we share rivers, so if they're they, they built a dam on their side and they're controlling it, we, sometimes we get overflowed, sometimes we have drought because of that. And it's all controlled by Indian like India. So you know, there's been like a long uh, like issue about dams with India and Bangladesh. And it's kind of really complicated and a lot of politics goes on in it. But, you know, we, I, we suffer and that's just, I mean, it's just reality. But still, it's, it's still legal because, I mean, kind of legal, even though morally questionable, but it's legal because it's India and it's their own land and they're doing things in their country, in their part, their land. So it's, I mean, they have the right to do that and all of that. So it's legal. And I know it's legal and the, the legal yeah. system should change, right? And it doesn't yeah. change. Uh, yeah. Here it's like China. It's not even their land or anything. It's so... Yeah, well, uh, yeah, it's 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 really bad in the U.S. too. Um, so, what about your Supreme Court? You have a Supreme Court that decides if certain things are legal or not, and does it have a a system of property rights? I would imagine every country has some kind of set of 
laws related to property rights. Um, but I don't know, I just know our country is just incredibly backward. Uh, in Bangladesh, Professor, you're asking about, uh, okay. yeah, I mean, yeah, we have our own set of property laws. So it's, so property laws and like uh, ownership of things, it's kind of complicated because, I mean, there's uh, also like religious aspect to it as well so there's muslim laws and as well so which is like the followed by the majority so i guess the for for private property that is for i mean public property it's just uh whatever the uh constitution tells us so whatever is written in uh, or just uh, decreed by the supreme court that's how it goes i mean for i mean it's been like uh since our independence there's like sort of uh, laws and uh, rights set up right but like the court the not even supreme court the congress can uh change them and uh yeah, like lobbyers and it's just politics a lot of that but like they can government can change that if they want to and if we go and if the if we disagree and if we go to supreme court to appeal it or something i mean nobody really does it we can if we want to if we're if we think something is unfair or unjust whatever the government's doing but it's really hard to win yeah <laughs> it takes supreme money that, it takes yeah, money. That, yeah that's what carol marx would say uh rossi did you study it? Do you know about the, the legal system and the property rights system in Cambodia? Not really, Professor. Like, um, I don't really get involved in a lot of no, like, that's okay. the details of that, so yeah. But, you know, I, I'm also curious if like the, either the UN or the NGOs could sue, right, China or, somebody for the damages right yeah i think that's actually what they should be doing but there seems to be like so quiet like there used to be like kind of like an outbreak in cambodia like a lot of people were like talking about it and then it's like the fires burning for like five minutes and then like they begin to not yeah, I know. So. well i think the un is a paper tiger and the u.s set it up to be that way so they can, you know, they have good scientists, they have all the data, even though Trump tried to get the EPA in the US, they really destroyed a lot of data. There were a lot of environmentalists that went and saved the data onto their own machines. Um, but the UN has this store of data. It's just that they don't have any power, right? And so, yeah. I think property rights are still probably following the John Locke model. I mean, it would be interesting to, to research that, but um, then it's the question of whether the Congresses can pass laws, which is same in the US, the Congress could pass a law and the Supreme Court would just say it's, this decision is consistent with this law. But of course the fossil fuel billionaires contribute billions to political campaigns. And so they get their person elected and their person makes these laws in their favor. Um, but, you know, I just kind of, it's just curious to me to what extent does exactly that same trend occur in developing countries? And then it would be intervention with Chinese companies or European countries, right? Or, you know, Bangladesh's, the developing countries might have some of their own companies, but they're less likely to be as large and as powerful as the outsiders coming in. Um, but anyway, again, in your lifetime, all this stuff is going to come to a head and um, something will have to give. So I, I would imagine there will be a paradigm shift.
in you know Congresses will pass things because it'll be such a desperate situation and voters will want them, right? They'll vote for the people that want them to be able to breathe <laughs> or eat, but it's just so, you have to wait until the problem gets so bad before anybody really wakes up, you know, but it's better late than never. And it's definitely gonna happen in your lifetime. Um, all right. Um, how about Connie? Do you have your paper? Yes, um, and I sent you a presentation. Um, can you share your screen because it will help me and also. I so so you, can't, you can't get to it, Connie? Yeah, I I I I I will do now, but I you need to show like my presentations. I made a little bit um outline and I send it to you. Oh and I have my PC so I can share with my PC. So I sent you. Can you share it for me? I'm not sure if I know how to do that, but somebody could, I mean, because I just gave you permission to share it. Right? Can you just open it up yourself and share it? Oh, well, uh, my PC is uh, not with me right now. I'm using my phone. It, it, you can, it's you can some... forward, you can forward um, her email to me. Dr. Okay. And I can Here share my screen. Okay. Thanks, Ross. Oh, well, then it will take, take me with maybe some time. But... Here we go. Okay. I mean, again, I, it's kind of crazy that I don't know how to do it. Um, Thank you, Razi. It's fine. <laughs> learn. Okay. I mean, the yeah. thing, yeah. Unless I do things enough times, I don't remember from one time to the other. That's another problem. But uh, I'll just have to learn stuff. So, so is that? that Hi, I forwarded it. Um, I, I didn't receive it yet. Not Wait, let yet. me refresh. Oh, here it is. Okay. Okay, give me a second. I'll share it now. Okay. Can you see the screen? Yep. Okay. Yeah, I can see that. Thank you. Um, I'm really sorry because, you know, I really mixed up with every time presentation. So I was thinking to make a little bit this for me to understand. <laughs> so, well, um, so my topic is uh, early marriage in Bangladesh and Maybe some of you think that uh, how is it connected to the environment? Well, then um, I will say that, you know, this is part of every person ethics and also environment ethics to protect the innocent girls and, you know, get their opportunity to study and, you know, uh, establish them as boy and also not to, not to, get them married to work for or this pass the rest of life as a housewife because um it's 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 a huge uh, mistakes that we made and it's a belief and religious things sometimes people did but what i think is that it's a responsibility and an ethics for all of us to not to do that and this is why i choose this topic so uh, honestly, I'm going to mention two effects that happened because of early marriage. But first, I'm going to talk about a little bit early marriage in Bangladesh. You know, early marriage is um, really common things in Bangladesh, and and very large percent of Bangladesh people think of early marriage for their younger daughter as approved and encouraged by 
religious belief and social customs. But, you know, some people think that early marriage is religious and cultural thing as I told before, but they don't know that um, they have to, uh, well, to do it is con considered sin and is socially condemned. And this concept is racist and also sexist because it's, it makes discrimination between gender because where girls get chance to study, but sorry, boy got chance to study, but girl doesn't. And this is a huge sexist between genders, I think. And racist also, of course. And sometimes uh, people in Bangladesh also used to think that if our girls get old, and then they become more educated, then they might disobey their parents and com commit some sin that is against the religions. So it's better to keep them married early. These weird things people used to think the village size in Bangladesh. And it's, it's, it's the old culture. That's why it's became so normal. I heard from my grandmother that when my grandmother was around five or six, then she got married and, and she was so little and cannot even wear anything, something like that. And it's, 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 it's really funny, but it's really, it's the reality. But right now people see to uh, give Mary's daughters years like 18 or 17, but before it was like five or six. So honestly, today I'm going to talk about the main two thing and that is two main effect of early marriage, one of his girls drop out from his schools and another one is died during child bite, I mean, pregnancy, early pregnancy. Well, uh, so I'm going to talk about the first one now. So despite significant uh, progress in many genders and reproductive health indicators, out of three girls in Bangladesh, two girls are drop out from his schools just because of get married. And most becomes mothers while they are still child. And when girls get married early, they are more like to drop out from his school as we know all. Because it's, it's so simple to know because they can't handle both of their study and their household work and, and the pressures of a mental health and a lot of things because it's still, she's so, how to say so young. So the major problem in Bangladesh now is uh, after marriage that they cannot continue their study because of that household work and maintain a whole family. And basically they don't have any control over their life. That is why this happens. Uh, and they got married in teenage. Everything has control by their family in their life. They feel a lot of pressures of being married in teens. But honestly, they didn't have anything option to do. Even for me, when I was like uh, maybe intermediate levels, uh, my my aunt, uncle, my, my uncle and my, my auntie, my whole family except my father. So they all think to get me married, but um, I I pursued my dad by saying that I don't want to get married and I want to study and a lot of stuff like that. And finally, I, I persuaded. So sometimes it happens. Uh, even all the girls in Bangladesh that they doesn't have, you know, really conscious about their life. They doesn't have option to share opinion. But but it's different. Maybe it's kind of different in the town, but in village this is happen. So there is also something that, you know, fifteen percent of girls in Bangladesh uh, will be illiterate. In, 2013, according to US research, and also we must invest now to secure girls' right to girls' right to live and education, and reduce their exposure to violence and uh, ex, uh, and, and exploitation. And it, it says by Vera Mendonca from a uh, agents in United Nations 2020. So. The second one is um, die during pregnancy, as I mentioned, that are around uh, 
52,000 uh, 52, women die every year in Bangladesh because of early pregnancy. And teenage girls don't have any proper idea of birth control. Of course, they don't have because they are not educated that much. And they don't know how to stay healthy because they are still child and how they will take proper birth control as, as educated men, men to. It's hard for them to catch up with everything because of lack of knowledge about protections. They got married so early, even they become 20. And after during childbirth, 20% of mothers, uh, you know, stay heavy risk. And I already mentioned that 2,000 women die every year. And also, you know, it's a horrible thing to say that Bangladesh is the first ranking country because of the maternity deaths. And it's, it's a high risk of maternity deaths in all over the world. And the information is given by Charity 2017. I have mentioned all of the resources that I am taking information. Well, and, and then my opinion, this is my opinion. <laughs> I, I put it, but like for me, for betterment, but I will say really this little bit that ending a child marriage is a duty for both the governments of Bangladesh and the peoples. And I think that sustainable def uh, development goal, it, it's it's a organization SDG called target to end child marriage by 2030. And the national target to end child marriage in Bangladesh is 1041 and that inform and that information is given by UNICEF 2020 and it is really disgusting thing that why foreigner organizations take a step early but our country government is taking that step really you know plates and and as a Bangladeshi I feel really upset about it I think Bangladesh uh, government and the people's um, requires more effort to bring change and this will take a step immediately to abolish early marriage from the society. And in addition, sorry, and in addition, uh, we can abolish early marriage by educating our generations from now on, because if we get uh, teach our children that uh, your sister have the same rights as you have so then they will run the equal rights for girls. And in the future, they will also give the same opportunity to their daughter also. And also we can even uh, do one more thing is that we can give girls chance to study. That will help them more, like not to discriminate between gender. So that's the main thing, I think. And also early marriage, uh, you know, does not have uh, only these two problems, but there are thousand problems because of early marriage. And some of them are violence, jewelry, and gender discrimination. And many girls have been victims of jewelry after marriage. I have seen in my own eye. And it was really horrible to see how their husband beat them up for jewelry, for money. And it's, it's on kind of violence for money, I think. And this is the worst thing in Bangladesh. Some people think that they cannot continue to their to educate their daughters because of the financial problem. But at the last, when they give their daughters married, they, they got her got they, then they, their daughter got punished because of the dowry. And 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 this is this is really a sad thing. So I think this needs really to be stopped. I think we should all, all, all need to be, you know, you know, give them boys and girls, give them both the same opportunity, and then we can stop it. And um, this was, this is was what. Oh, I'm sorry. This is what I wanted to say. <laughs> Thank you. And if you have any questions or comment, you're you're really free to go. And these are the reference. Can you go down? This is the reference that where I take the information of. Yeah. Okay, good. All right, we can quit the screen share. Thanks, Rossi. Okay, um, Kanish, 
Why don't you check that one article we read about lifeboat ethics? So a man wrote about, okay, we're on lifeboats and don't let poor people in or we'll, you know, everybody will drown. And then there's a response to that. And the response is that if you educate women, they'll have fewer children, right? So you, could, yeah. yeah, you should go back to that article and um, see, you know, that's uh, an alternative point of view that um, the international community has an interest in making, in getting these women to stay in school. It's not just a matter of family opinion. It's really a matter of reducing the population and preventing, you know, the end of life on earth. Um, and then you could go see, are there NGOs that sort of follow that line of reasoning? Are there NGOs trying to keep women in school or trying to educate them? Um, yeah, uh, sorry. I mean, the way to link this yeah. climate change would be that article that we read about keeping women in school is important for reducing environmental problems, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Sorry, your voice is breaking down. Oh, really? Okay, I'll have to, <sighs> I'm getting tired, but gee, the night is young for me, you know? I'm usually <laughs> up another two hours. <laughs> But uh, oh, well. uh, yeah, I, I've been hanging out with my grandkids. I'm kind of worn out, but I'm happy. I'm just worn out. Um, so I, you should look in order to like, uh, sure, sure, Sauda, of course. Just um, so just to link this issue to the environmental issue, uh, just try to go back to that one article that I assigned. It's called A Response to Lifeboat Ethics. And just, you know, a couple things about if you keep women educated, keep them in school, not getting married, then, and you convince them that the, the few children they have will stay healthy and stay alive and take care of them when they're older, that'll that's a better way to reduce the population so then you can link the child marriage to the problem of overpopulation which is a basic problem for how to prevent environmental destruction does that make okay, sense okay. is that okay Connie? just make that yeah, yeah i'll, I'll add another paragraph or two. Okay. yeah i'll add that too i'll add that too don't worry i'll add that too I mean, I remember when I taught it. Well, see, I read this, I don't know, 40, 50 years ago, I read that. But here I am, you know, when I teach it, I go, oh, this is you guys. <laughs> Are you planning to have a whole lot of kids? No. Well, I want to stay educated and I'm going to, you know, it's just like, yes, that's what they have in mind. You are their test case, right? This is it. Um, the trouble is there's not a lot of you. <laughs> out there but yeah okay so everybody needs a round of asking cunnage or a comment or a question so Saristi do you have something uh no professor it was like um I found it uh, after uh, her paper like I found it more related to the traditional ethics of the society right. more than the environmental ethics Right, so that that one article we studied would be the link. Do you already know about, I mean, do you have a lot of information about child marriage? I wonder, a lot of my students write on it. Yes, uh, it's it's like very common in Bangladesh as Kanish also mentioned in village areas and also sometimes in, uh, in cities as well, like especially for the people who live under the poverty line and it's uh, it actually it's reduced in the city now but in village it's really common yeah 
so I'm just wondering, Kanij. Uh, uh, also, Professor, I wanted to share one thing. One of my cousins are also getting married. Like when I last met uh, met her was two years ago, and she was like just um at standard nine or something, eight or nine. And like I just found some days ago, uh, they called us and like they told us that they in they gave us this invitation of her marriage and I like what why she's getting married like she's just a child uh, like I am not even married yet why is she's marrying and like my parents are telling me like no it's like very common their family is poor like they need to uh, get their daughter married first to someone real uh, someone stable who can keep her happy and this <laughs> I like this didn't make sense to me and of sense so yeah over time it's not very good i'm just sad that's very cool. but she's that's, very happy very like the girl who's marrying <laughs> that's I, weird my question yeah. my question kind of just for for women like you who get through high school and you go to college do all of you are all of you kind of aware of all these statistics and things is it just something that you know the information on just because it's so common and you all want to know about it or are some girls in Bangladesh oblivious to what's going on Connie no you know what yeah I I raised in village um if, so I'm still in village so it from childhood to now I I raised by seeing that I raised by seeing that and when I able to understand that it's 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 not good and and it's it should be stopped and then i started writing about it and i had more interest on it and i i, I really want to do something but it's hard to do something alone because when all the community is for one that you are the opposite then then you we can't say anything i think earlier i have shared with you one thing that my own cousins got married when uh, and she's maybe five years younger than me, or or like six years younger than me, uh, she got married and it's been two years. So when that's happened, I was in the UW and, and I, I I didn't contact with my family for one month. I couldn't talk with my any person in the family, even my mom and dad was like, oh my God, why you are not talking with me or something like that? And I say, why did you do that? Because you you know and you are educated, then why you allow it? Why you do that? Like one month I didn't talk with anyone and I was crying so much that my sister was really young, really young. I think uh, in 2018, uh, she was around 12, 13 or, or 14, I think, maybe 14. So, you know, I, I cannot like agree with that. And, and it was really sad for me. and. And later on, it's it's fine now. It's fine now, but it's still, I, I I really cannot agree with that. Even when I see my uncle and auntie, I feel guilty, like inside of myself, and I really don't want to talk with them. But but I have to agree with it, and that's all. Okay. So, does anybody else have a question or comment for Connie? Rossi, Ramisa, or Sauda? Because we're actually taking plenty of time. So, and Raihana appeared. So, so if you don't have a question or comment, then Raihana, do you have your research paper? Are you ready to present? Hello, Professor. Hope you all are doing well and fine. Yes, I do have my research paper and I, I already submitted my final paper also. You know, Professor, because I was going through a very hard time and it has been one week that I have access to nothing, no internet connection, no light. I'm very far from my own area. That's why okay. I had no so access with it's fine, you know, it's fine. I, I believe it. I believe all every story Susan is telling. I just need you to, to present your research paper. That's it. 
Okay, Professor, in my research paper we, there, I talked about the um, worst uh, weather condition in Afghanistan, which is in my own country, where I wrote about the air condition. It is causes many problem like Oops. Raihana, are you there? Uh, I think she's muted. Can you check your device again? I, oh, I think I have uh, she having trouble with internet and the internet is not good, I think. Yeah, it was really good. And then all of a sudden it was dead. Um, yeah, the, the women from Afghanistan, oh my, they're like, oh boy. Anyway, so we haven't even gotten to the final papers yet. So let's do it. And when Raihana gets, when we hear her, we can, um, you know, maybe cut out and listen to her before it shuts down again. So Sristi, what, what are you going to do with your final paper? Um. Professor, yes. Uh, sorry, sorry to cut in. Uh, should I wait for uh, late? Oh yeah. Something? Okay. Sauda was going to present her research. Yeah, she said she wasn't ready, and now she says she is ready. So fine, Sauda. It's great. Uh, I mean, no, Professor. I thought like we would give since we are giving kind of like an informal informal presentations, right. just an oral one. So I thought I could just talk about whatever I have, just an overview of what I've done. So it's okay. Go ahead. Uh, so, and since we don't have that many students as well, so I thought maybe I can, I should. Okay. So for me, uh, I don't have a back. Um, I, okay. Exact title for you, but uh, I, want, uh, I want to start with, uh, just a quote uh, that's like kind of a shit. Oh, okay, can I get a five minutes, Professor, to just, yeah, sorry. Okay, so, okay, so let's go back to the final papers. Okay, Soda, I'll wait till the end and you can do both your papers at once. Is that okay? Uh, yes. Thank you, Professor. Okay. Sorry, I lost my... That's okay. Uh, we'll just put you at the end. That's fine. Uh, Sristi, what are you going to write your final paper on? Yes. Uh, I'm really sorry, Professor. I, I couldn't prepare a proper outline for today's uh, the final paper because I actually sent you an email about it last uh, yesterday. Uh, maybe I I think you couldn't check it, so it was like uh, I was having all the deadlines these in this week for my three courses, and it was like really hard for me to prepare two papers like the research paper. Yeah. Okay. So okay. I okay. So I, I mean, yeah. I, I know. Paper. I've gotten a lot of emails, but this yeah. paper. I mean, the stuff was due two months ago. You know. So yeah, it's fine. Uh, but professor, I, I'm, I will be, I will show you it uh, in the office hours next day. Yeah, okay. I mean. Is it okay, professor, if I present yeah, it on that's, the Yeah, that's fine. You can just say pass, you know. Yeah, um, thank you, But professor. yeah, yeah, it's not good to give reasons because most students just wait until the last minute and that's not good, but it doesn't matter, it's over. Uh, Rossi, what are you going to write your final on? So I finished my final and my final is on my final paper. Oh, uh, let me pull it up. Give me a second. I pulled up the wrong one. Um, yeah. I'm sorry. And Dr. Beck, I did send you the wrong one also. I upload my research paper in to my final one. That's why when I look in Google Classroom, I only see my final paper. My bad. I, I will re-upload it for you. I did that with my other class that I didn't send the pre-class video 
I sent my night class, my full I, <laughs> psychology. I was, like, I was like, where is my final paper? I already uploaded, but I only see my research paper. Anyways, I wrote about the epitome of environmental destruction. And I talk about how everyday self-interest overrides sustainability and the survival of the commons and how um, humans wind up suffering from their own selfishness. So there must be a paradigm shift. And my essay focuses on the flaws of modern environmental ethics through the body whitening lotion issue and my perspectives on how we can move forward as a society. I discuss about how Cambodia and many countries in Southeast Asia were once colonized by Western civilizations and Westerners have corrupted the minds of the people here to believe that happiness lies within their skin tone. So what people here are trying to do is use these bleaching creams to um, lighten their skin and it supports Bentham's philosophy of the principle of utility and the great, uh, greatest happiness principle to justify how people are so obsessed with lighter skin tone because that's like what makes them happy and that's their happiness. And then I talk about how the rise in popularity of body whitening lotions and cosmetics are associated with environmental concerns, health concerns, and animal rights. For environmental concerns, I divide it into three sections. One is the loss of resources where beauty brands are using natural products as bandwagon, so they cut down a lot of trees and rainforests for palm oil plantations and for um, land for factories. And then I talk about the rapid increase in carbon footprint from the extraction, production and distribution of these whitening lotions. And lastly, for environmental issues, I, oh, relating to um, the rise in carbon footprints, I linked it to Karl Marx capitalism, where there's a constantly need for new markets where companies are going from country to country to promote their whitening products and expand the beauty industries. And then another environmental concern is related to pollution, air, water, and soil pollution, where a lot of these plastic, oh, a lot of these products are wrapped in plastic, single use plastic that has never been recycled and they end up in landfills and lit on in the oceans and micro bacteria grow and travel to other countries contaminating countries with diseases. And also the chemicals cause a change in behaviors and death of aquatic species. And then I go on to talk about the health concerns associated with body whitening products caused by the misuse of toxic ingredients. I talk about the mild side effects and also about the misuse of hydroquinoid and mercury and how that causes um, fatal liver, kidney and nerve damage and creating abnormalities in newborn babies. And then I also discuss about animal testing and the cruelty around it and animal rights and how um, animals are being used to test and then they are being killed and dissected to see the impacts of these chemicals in the animals. And I linked it to Ken's view on animals rights. And I say that although Ken says that um, if the cruelty is a result of experiments that promote human well-being, the cruelty is justified. I said that Kent would then support the animal testing on beauty products because um, that's not human's happiness. Like our happiness do not lie on those short-term commercial pleasures. And then I um, concluded with how people are stuck in a mind of beauty from generation to generation, where we emphasize the significance of lighter skin tone. And in order to achieve this 
unrealistic commercial happiness. People will go out of hand and do anything to achieve that. And I think that one way to put an end to this need is for us to educate the young because youth are like a white canvas where we should paint them with a love for the environment and society so can so they can diverge their unattainable um so they can diverge their attention from this unobtainable short-term happiness okay so the only point I think you might actually have it in your paper is that's the end of my yeah. um, essay right so the only point I wanted to say was when you talk about Bentham's view of happiness and Mill, it's the idea that you're free to live as you like, as long as you don't harm someone else. And so on the old paradigm, you could do a lot of things without doing harm, but on the new paradigm, right? Everything you do harms. Does that make sense, Rossi? Are you there? I lost her, I think. Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah. Can you, did you hear me though, Rossi? No. Okay. Oh, so, my Wi-Fi was cut off. Yeah, okay. So it's just, when you talk about Bentham and then you start in. So right when you're making that transition, happiness, um, Bentham and Mill emphasized you're free to do as you like as long as you don't harm anybody else. And until 70 years ago, perhaps none of this really did harm other people. But now we have to have a paradigm shift where you realize that everything you do harms other people in multiple ways. And then you, and then you start in on listing all those ways. Did you already put that in there or does that make sense to you? Yes, I, I, I put that in there after. Yeah, okay. Okay. All right. So comments or questions? Go ahead. Srisi, do you have a comment or question? No, Professor. It's just an example where you take one product and you look at all these things about it and then you can think, oh, Here's another product and all that thing, all those things are true, right? All these similar, similar DVDs, every product, like the one is taken for an example. Right. Um, so Ramisha, do you have a comment or a question? Uh, no, Professor. Uh, Sauda? Um, yeah, yes, Professor. Um, so it is like, We've talked about this before in class and how like the uh, just a colonial mentality and how our mind is kind of uh, colonized by the West and how all of this product, uh, like the drive we have to get uh, buy this product kind of stems from those kind of uh, mentality and those deep rooted issues. So and uh, it's like, when I think about it, Professor, it's all of these problems that we have, like uh, from the corals to agriculture, like sustainable agriculture, and now this like product and like the product placement and issues of, it's just all of the, like the, all of the reasons behind it, of all of the reasons behind all of these problems are just, human greed, if I think about it. It's well, that'll, <laughs> that'll do. <laughs> that's, I what, mean, that's what the Greeks said, right? That that's the one vice that destroys political community. There's like all of this, uh, like sustainability. And if we think about like the structure of environment and now like this kind of products that are environmentally harmful, but they're targeted towards people like the skin tones and just uh, just all of this, all of these. It's just a ways for people to make money, even though it's harming 
the society, harming the environment, and just overall doing very little good to anybody. But it's still happening. Why? <laughs> because money and human greed, and there's people who doesn't care about the consequences, and they just care about their own happiness and their just money and earning and getting rich. And it's just at the end of the day, all of like motivation behind most of these problems is human grit. Well, it's also um, remember in the article on advertising, right toward the beginning, it said in order to sell a bunch of stuff, we have to make women insecure and unsatisfied. Yeah. Yes, right. Professor, I remember it. Like that stuck with me a lot. Yeah, well, this is just one example, but there's tons of examples, right? Um, mm -hmm. Huge amount of money. There's also fear, right? You can play on fear. And then sometimes you can trace that fear back to greed, right? Um, sometimes you just, people just like power and they'll appeal to fear to get power. But yeah, greed is pretty bad. Uh, Anybody else want to comment on Rossi's paper? If not, what we have left, I think, oh, Ramisha, and then I'll do Raihana. Okay, this is the last order. Sauda will do both of hers and Raihana will do both of hers. But I think, Ramisha, have you done your final yet? I haven't done professor, but I think I can give some information about my final paper. So uh, this is not the exact outline, but I have some thoughts about it. So okay. for the uh, uh, for my environmental ethics, I think for the uh, protection of the environment, I think we should change some points. So I think people's mindset should be changed since their childhood. So, uh, so that they will love and protect the environment when they become adult. So uh, they will consider both the sustainability and the development of the economy. Therefore, I think uh, if we can use uh, religion perspectives and uh, art and uh, religious uh, religion perspectives and art effectively in our education system, uh, I think it will change youngers' mindset in terms of protection of the environment. So for the uh, first, uh, I will talk about the importance of the environment and how it's uh, exploited. And I will give some examples from my own country. And uh, then I will, uh, I will explain how a religion perspectives we can use in uh, our education system to uh, change uh, children's uh, thoughts about the environment. Uh, then uh, I will talk like how we can use art, like dancing, uh, music and the art, how we can use uh, those uh, concepts uh, to uh, to uh, change the youngest uh, thoughts about the uh, environment. So, so I will talk about these two points in my final paper. But still, I haven't uh, gathered information about it. I'm uh, I'm doing I'm still doing. So that's the my final paper. Uh, okay. So I know the United Nations has. Uh, at least one big document about educating children for environmental awareness. So I think you can find that if you go on the United Nations website. Oh, oh okay, Professor, yeah. And then I haven't, uh, yeah. You could check uh, various NGOs. Um, I mean, that would be, you know, it's just interesting. Um, yeah, that's what I, you know, uh, AUW has a proposal to try to get a master's degree in climate change. And I, I would like to argue that because it's an all women's school, there'll be a lot of undergraduates that would be interested in educating children to be aware. And so that, that would be a unique contribution that having this at AUW as opposed to somewhere else. Um, but I, I do think AUW should really sort of get into the 
try to be at the forefront for education because of the liberal arts education, you know, but yeah. I, I guess I'll, I'll just talk to the higher ups, but um, yeah, Ramisha, I think, I think that, you know, children, if you, they naturally would sympathize with animals and plants because they're afraid, right? They feel vulnerable too. And so it's not hard to get kids to, you know, want to turn lights off or want to, you know, unless you really mess them up when they're little. Um, it's just sad to see that you could, it's not rocket science to condition them to care, but we do, you know. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Anybody else have a comment or question on that? Uh, anybody know anything about education for the environment? Just, all right. So uh, what we'll do is we'll go to Sauda for both of hers and then we'll go to Raihana for both of hers. So go ahead, Sauda. Uh, so, <laughs> I'll just start with uh, some of my research paper. So uh, my research paper, uh, the, the topic that I'm writing on is uh, biodiversity loss, loss and like the ethics and morality behind it. So I've like, uh, I started with like the biodiversity loss in Shundarban, which is like very rapidly happening and like really uh, has been going on for a long time and there's really, not much protect, environmental protection given to it, like as much as it should be. And like uh, in, I, I have written like papers before about like biodiversity loss and like in, because my major, because of my major, I've talked about it a lot. And I've always covered like the scientific aspect of it, like the uh, global warming and why, uh, biodiversity loss is happening, what can we do to uh, protect it and convert, conserve nature and conserve the ecology of the species and all of that. But like, this is my first time like diving into the morality behind it and which was like really new and uh, really thought provoking. <laughs> so I want to, uh, so I want to uh, start with a quote, like, Give you uh, give you guys an insight. So this is one one of the quotes that I included in my uh, research paper. It's 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 uh, by Annie Dillard, and it's from her book. Uh, she's an American author, and it's from her book Pilgrim at Tinker Creek. Oh it's yeah, I love that system. book. I love that book. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's a nonfiction book, uh, and yep. Yeah, as you said, Professor, I, I haven't read the book fully, uh, but I'm, I am I didn't finish it, but I have started. And I, I think I will after like all of the final things uh, is done, I, I would uh, like to finish it. It's really interesting, Professor. So anyway, so the quote that I wanted to share with you was like, Evolu evolution loves death more than it loves you or me. This is easy to write, easy to read, and hard to believe. So the message, like the ethics behind uh, mass destruction, like mass extinction of species, and uh, how like we're failing to protect it is like really complicated. There's like different levels to it, how, because we, we are always, it's been like, it's been going in for decades, centuries, we've been, we've known that global warming is happening and that we are, that a lot of species are going extinct, extinct and where like nature is getting destroyed, we need to protect them. And we always just keep hearing we need to protect them, but very little in terms of action that we are taking that actually protects this species and everything. Like the only example I could give that we've been like successfully able to protect and species from extinction is the pandas. So the, how like the China have been 
able to nurture and bring back the uh, pandas from extinction and how they're like uh, protecting it. And if so that's like the only example of successful avoidation of extinction. But even then that, uh, that has uh, a lot of layers behind it. We always hear about, so the first one that, uh, that I don't think that I discussed in my paper was the, how we perceive animals why why there's not many like why there's not a stronger drive to protect this extinct animals to avoid this mass uh, extinction of species one reason is the perceived uh, belief or just the view of animals in our society or in our minds so it takes the it takes a morality behind it so and we've studied in class about it a lot so I mean, if we follow like Aristotle or even like the Christian philosophers, a lot of them argues that like the since only on the only beings that are rational and capable of determining their actions are are the beings which we should like extend our concern to. So that's Kant, like Kant is the main one, right? Yeah, yes, Professor. I uh, I mean I, I'm coming to it. Oh. Yeah. So yeah, it's okay. Uh, so like a lot of these views um, like uh, kind of do you, I, I don't know if it's the right word to use, but it like dehumanizes animals and other species in our mind. So the, as Professor was saying, the main, uh, the biggest influential philosopher is Immanuel Kant, which uh, who says like the, mm, whose view of animals is kind of that's most influ influential. And like, according to Kant, like morally permissible actions are the actions that are willed by rational individual in certain situations or circumstances. So the like important, uh, the, the, his conception of the moral status of animals is in his like uh, notion of the willing so while like both animals and human beings have desires that can compel them to action, uh, only like us human beings are like cap capable of standing uh, back or deciding fr from uh, which actions to take, like they can control their desires and choose which action they can, they want to take. But in his mind, animals, they, their drive is completely by instinct and it, it's just automatic. They can't decide, they can't, think they don't have that consciousness so this ab ability is of will is kind of separates us from uh, animals and since animals like lack this ability they lack a will so they are not autonomous and since they don't have any will at all they, since they cannot have good wills since like the Kant's whole view was as we uh, studied in class was about good wills. And since animals can't have good wills, so therefore they don't have any intrinsic value. And that's why like uh, we are already, since it, they, they don't have intrinsic value, we don't have to you know, care about them. It doesn't matter if we uh, kill them, it doesn't matter how we treat them. The, like these views are like already making animals and other species is second class, like something other to us and kind of stripping our moral responsibility from them. Like we don't care about it as much. Like we already see animals and, uh, and like other species in such a light that it's really not as important on concerning or morally uh, wrong to us to see this uh, species get extinct. It doesn't uh, make us as guilty because we already don't see them in that light to or give that importance to them. Uh, in my research, I also like uh, found like other, other than current, there's like countless of 
well, not countless, but there's a lot of philosophers that hold this view of like an animal. Like, so one notable that I mentioned in my paper was Descartes. So the Descartes view of animals. So the first, uh, according to Descartes, like there's there was like human beings are only are the only ones that are ca capable of complex and novel behavior. So this behavior is like not a result of res simple responses to like the stimuli, but it's uh, instead it's kind of a result of our reasoning and uh, how we perceive the world. So. And there's like a lot of long uh, talk about it, a lot of uh, reasoning and uh, reasoning and like uh, discussion. But in the end, uh, at all of it, it says like uh, there's like, and it's like common in most uh, philosophers. They will they will go like, however, like we have no uh, reason to believe that animals have higher order thoughts. It's like a common uh, theme in all of these uh, philosophers that animals don't have a higher order thoughts. They don't have that consciousness. Uh, that's why uh, there's like no reason to believe, believe that they are capable of making their own choices. They're just, you know, going through the motion uh, motivated by instinct. So animals are already seen as something other than humans and these views of animals that the animals are not as uh, highly intelligent as human and humans are kind of like perceived as a higher beings than these species because we have reasons and we have we can you know uh, make our own choices and stay away from our desire and, and all of that that's why animals are always kind of uh, treated as like a second class species. So all of the species except human being, and this is also, it's not just philosophers, all the religions are also have that view. Um, for my uh, uh, personal experience, like the human being in our religion, in Islam, humans are like, uh, it's written in the, Quran and it's it's a, like a huge important uh, part of our philosophy, Muslim philosophy or Islam, is that uh, the best creature that uh, God created is humans, and we are the best. We and the reasoning is also same that that because we have consciousness and we are giving we we are given free will, we can choose. That's the reasoning behind it. And that's why we are the uh, greatest creature that God created. And, and all of these philosophers and all of, this, all of the major religions, they all have the same view of human superiority. And it kind of contributes to that uh, uh, perspective of how we don't take any action toward all of this mass extinction because we already see this species in these lights. And the second is, uh, so after that, the second one uh, reason uh, I discuss is like perceived mo morality of direct versus indirect harm. So even though, I mean, we all talked about how animals are like lesser than us. And obviously as species, we are, a lot of us are um, like, not all of us are, majority of us are not herbivores. We are all consuming meat and other animals. So there's a whole philosophy of that on its own. But also, when, also we can say that, what? No, we care about animals. We care about other species. We don't uh, uh, want to like harm them. We want to protect them and all of that. But the reason behind our one of uh, the reasons behind our inaction is the perceived morality, which is like direct and indirect harm. So in this case, because all of this mass extin extinction, like we can feel bad, be bad and go vegan for animals because we are consuming them, right? We are, uh, there's mass industry that are 
killing uh, animals, chickens, cows, and other species, and we're consume, consuming it. So there's like, you can find a morality behind it. You can find a guilt that we are killing or taking life, right? That's a direct harm that we are inflicting upon another uh, species. But for the mass extinction that's happening because of the environmental issues, because of global warming, that's an indirect harm that we are causing. We're not directly going on killing off all of the species and causing them to have mass, mass extinction, right? So that's why it's like an indirect harm. And the morality behind it is a little gray because we are not directly harming them. So it's not as precious to us or it's not as it doesn't ring uh, a ring a bell inside our heart that we, are, we will be responsible for it. We don't feel responsible for it because the harm is indirect. We are using fossil fuels, we are destroying the environment and causing the extinction of the species, but we are not actually like directly doing it. It's indirect. indirect. And the morality of indirect uh, harm is really gray and there's lots of people. I mean, there, one example that I've, I've put in my paper was like the, how we uh, consent to abortion. So we are always, since uh, people always uh, prefer indirect harm uh, rather than direct harm. So the date of it, uh, fetus will be really, uh, it would make us feel really guilty and it would be really something grave to us. Death of a child, death of a fetus, or like if a pregnant woman is having an abortion, if the, ch if the child is months older and have developed, then we have this whole guilt and all of the religions and even us as people, we all try to avoid it. We, we think it as murder. Right, if a lot of people think it as murder that you, you're aborting your child, it, this is a full, fully like it, this is a developed fetus. It has a heart. It has, uh, well, it's debatable, but it has a conscience, and we feel guilty about it. We consider it as murder, but but we don't consider uh, using contraceptive as murder because that is that child that uh, hasn't existed yet. And all that, like, uh, it's uh, some Catholic hospital, they would like oppose aber abortion on principle. And they'd like, uh, so it is like same as Islam as well. So they would uh, consent to performing uh, hysterectomy on pregnant women whose lives are in danger, but they won't consent to a perform of an abortion. And the history, Direct to me would like not only kill the fetus, but it also like makes the women ster sterile. So in these cases, the Catholic hospitals, they would prefer an action that leads to a worse indirect harm. So the in the so in these in cases of uh, abortion, like the date, death of a fetus and uh, lifetime infertility for the woman, it's a, like a direct action, but it, it's a, like in, uh, Soda, you do need to, to cut it a little bit, right? You have to like. So that was like the example of like, instead of the, uh, I'll wrap it up. So instead of like the death of the fetus, we are considering. Uh, uh, yeah, no, I, I know your point. Months. I just, you gotta wrap it up here. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> sorry, I got carried away. Uh, so, that was like the, oh, uh, that is one like uh, perceived morality behind direct and indirect harm. And this is kind of the kind of the views and uh, ethics that we have that kind of contributes to the extinction of the species because we don't see the harm we are causing. We don't really feel it. It's an indirect harm that we are causing. So we don't feel as uh, 
responsible for it. We don't feel that, that it's our doing, it's the consequences. We don't consider it. And we are not as, since we don't feel as guilty, so obviously it's already back in our mind. We think it's not our fault really. So we don't really, because of it, because it's a indirect harm, we don't really feel responsible for it and we don't take actions. So those are like the main two things that I'm discussing in the paper about extinction of species and like loss of biodiversity and how the morality and uh, right. Actually, the ethics the, right. The indirect harm goes back to the paradigm shift from individuality, right? To yes. interconnected, right? Holistic, everything's interconnected. So again, in the enlightenment, you know, blank slate, nature's blank, individuals, you know, act as free agents. So, but the now, and they, it was just, I can do whatever I want as long as they don't harm anybody else. Well, yeah, okay. now the, it, the harm, you are harming on everything you do that you think you're, you know, you're not harming, you are harming. Does that make sense, uh, Sauda? Uh, yes, was that like Bentham professor? What? Bentham. Yeah, that was Bentham. It's a lot like Rossi's, right? Yeah, thank you. So that's fun. Uh, I think I might include that. Yeah, that's I, the paradigm I, I, shifting. Yeah. It's really important. Like, you're right. Right? Yeah. Uh, okay, now what are you going to do with your final? Uh, for my final professor, so I'm writing uh, about the uh, uh, animal rights in the, so I'm just uh, elaborating on my first paper, uh, which was about like the laws in Bangladesh about animal rights and um, mass uh, killing, not killing, like culling of dogs and any other animals. So how like the stray animals, dogs and cats, they're like uh, the cruelty to them, how they have been uh, treated in this country and the, the cruelty animal act of 1920 EA and how that was formed and the ethics behind it I talked about in the first paper and in my final paper I'm going to expand it and talk about the updates that have been made in animal welfare act in 2019 in, in Bangladesh and how like the whole situations, uh, how they're now, they have more rights and how the laws have been more strict in the, uh, in case of cruelty to, to animals. And there's have been uh, even uh, people sentenced. So one example was uh, that I'm, I'm going, I'm including in my paper is that there was a ca case that uh, two men, they went around killing dogs and puppies in their neighborhood, they round them up and killed them on the excuse that they, one of the, um, one dog bit a child. And they, so in that, uh, because of that reason, they went around killing uh, stray dogs and puppies in their area. And they kind of uh, round up a lot of dogs and kind of buried them alive. And local, like animal uh, uh, welfare, organizations and like a lot of organizations went to the site and you know uncovered this and contacted the police and then that they were that man was well it became a legal case and that man is supposed to have now I think he is the first one who would be uh, heavily punished in uh, because of cruelty to women so he might face jail time uh, and a lot of uh, he will face jail time and like um, he'll have to uh, donate money and like there's a, a lot, lot stricter laws now for that. So that was one case study that happened that the, that the law uh, that has been updated is now in effect. Okay, all right. 
you could also go back to the paradigm shift issue. Yes, and I think for the uh, 1921, the first paper, I talked about Kant a lot. I don't know. I think I feel like uh, in this whole semester, I just, I've been just uh, reading and thinking and talking about Kant. Uh, anyway, so like that, there's a, uh, I, I'm, I, I'm hoping to find uh, for my final paper, I'm hoping to find other uh, topic, not topics like other philosopher and other point of view then count as well, hopefully. Well, and please, uh, everyone, if you guys have any points and um, any suggestion, feedback to me, I would really appreciate it and welcome. Or any questions? Well, Vandava Shiva is at war against Bill Gates because Gates is thinks like Kant. He's on the side of environmental protection, but he wants technology. He just wants it all to be technology based, right? And she wants to be more sustainable. Does that make sense? So Kant, yeah, yeah Kant would be, yes, you know, use math, use technology for humans, right? So that humans will survive. And that's that's Gates, that's Gates's thing. So you might want to look at what Vandava Shiva versus Bill Gates. I really get mad because I don't think they should be at odds. They should really come together and figure out where sustainable agriculture is most viable and most important and most feasible and where it's not or where some other issue that Gates and technology need to do, like absorption of carbon or something, they really need to work together a lot more. It's, it's annoying. <laughs> uh, that would be my one recommendation. Because you know, you know, I said Kant is sort of the founder of the artificial intelligence and the techno files, right? Yeah. Okay. Descartes and Kant, they're just all in their head. Um, yeah, we should get to Raihana. Sure, thanks, Soda. That was good. It was all good. I just feel like I probably have to keep pushing people. Hello, Professor. Hello. Yeah, I'm, I'm really sorry for that. It's okay. Just go ahead, present. Okay, Professor, I'm going to start from my research paper. Go ahead. Uh, the, the title that, that I chose for my research paper was Air Pollution in Afghanistan. And what I wrote in the introduction is that I mainly discussed about the air pollution, that which is the main cause and the major cause in Afghanistan. It is which has one of the major issues. Uh, impacted human health due to toxicity, toxicity among people. The air quality in the city is extremely, extremely poor, dark with a lot of smoke and dust. Especially in winter, people don't have enough facilities to warm themselves in their houses. Can you just wait a minute, Professor? Go. And here I talked about the two main points, Professor. The first point is an increasing number of vehicle traffic is one of the main causes of air pollution in Afghanistan. Approximately 1 million cars, both new and old, run the streets of Afghanistan. And the second, uh, uh, the second point is along, is the increase, the increased number of cars. The poor quality of roads is another reason for compounding air pollution, and the government doesn't build the roads because of the limited budget, corruption, and the resources. It has become very difficult for the government to manage and provide the municip municipality to clean the roads or to rebuild the roads repeatedly.
this is what I wrote about the uh, in my research paper, professor, and in the final paper. The final paper, the topic that I choose was my environmental ethics. And here I have discussed about the environment. Environmental ethics is a branch of a study about the ethic, ethical relationships of nature and human beings. Excuse me, Professor, can you just wait a minute? Okay, we don't have anybody else to call on. <laughs> I'm really sorry, Professor. Professor, I like to talk about the topic. Just just to speak. Okay, so Raihana, are you ready or do you need me to wait? Yeah, it's fine, Professor. Right okay, now. go ahead. Go ahead. Go. Yeah, where I was is that I was talking about the environmental ethics, which was uh, which is about my final paper. And here I have discussed that environmental ethics concentrate on issues like policies, actions, and social attitudes to preserve the ecological system and biodiversity. As biodiversity is the main important part of human beings' life. It is the key to saving life on earth. Here I have mentioned two main points. The first point is that animal rights, uh, animals are a major part of this earth. They have the right not to be used for scientific advancement, medicine, food, fashion, and entertainment. Every single animal deserves to enjoy its space and rule in nature and have good life. And the second point is that all species have an important role to play in the existence of human beings on this earth because the well-being of all human all humans depends on all species nowadays we have caused the extinction of many species due to human activities like deforestation overhunting overfishing climate change and nitrogen pollution we have to keep all species healthy and protected as they provide a well-balanced ecosystem that maintains the health of our planet and environment. It helps human beings get access to clean water and air, which also fertilize the land for agriculture. Um, this is what I have mentioned in my final paper, Professor. Okay, so um, I guess one thing you could point out is that the first point has to do with our relationship toward the rest of the natural world. And the second point has to do with holistic thinking and the paradigm shift, right? That everything is connected to everything. And yes, so, yeah, so that those are different because even before, uh, you know, two centuries ago, you could still have this debate about our relationship to animals. But now with, you know, mass extinction and stuff, we have to have a, you know, we have to recognize uh, this whole different reality. I mean, it's, it's always been there. It's just, again, during the enlightenment, we ignored it. And we got to get back to just thinking holistically. And the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So does that make sense, Rayhana? The one view is it, during the enlightenment, it was how are we going to relate to the rest of the world? But the, the other one was post enlightenment. It's we, we really have to shift the paradigm. Okay, Connage wants to talk about her final and then, I, then we will be done. Go ahead, Connage. Oh, well, thank you so much, ma'am. So, uh, honestly, I, 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 I didn't write my final paper yet. Still, I'm, I am working on it. So I am really confused about the topic. So do you have suggestions for me in the topic? Well, what do you care about? 
I think based on environment, um, how to keep environment healthy or something like this. Well, we can go back over the whole class, you know. Um, what is this? All right. Um, I mean, what I, okay, my, I can do this for a second. Just go back over everything we've covered and what strikes you, like what was important to you. Uh, so Rossi took the whitening and just used that as a paradigm for all this other stuff. And it's all important. So she could take one small thing and link it to all these other things that are important. Um, but each student is going to pick out like Sauda, it's animals are just really her thing. Um, somebody else might emphasize that we have to think globally. So we have to, the UN, we have to uh, respect the United Nations a lot more than we have. And we've got to get international laws in there. Um, somebody else might just point out the power of Locke's view of property rights and how profound it is and how, how uh, rotten it is in terms of destroying the environment. And there were a lot of articles in the last four weeks about rationality and calculating the most efficient means to your own economic self-interest so some students who might want to write a whole paper just on the powerful impact of this sim simple and simplistic model of rights, property rights. Someone else could write a whole paper on the effect of thinking that the purpose of knowledge is power over nature, right? Then um, somebody could write a whole paper on dualistic thinking and how that's affected uh, environment. Someone else might write about happiness, pleasure, pain, and happiness, and how we still keep thinking we can do what we like as long as we don't harm other people, and yet we're harming other people. And so this is this particular uh, news article, our pursuit of happiness is killing the planet, right? So someone might want to write their final about that. Um, someone might want to write just about Karl Marx and what he said about the economy spreading all over the world and constantly moving to new markets. Someone might want to write about religion in general, or someone might want to write about Islam and the environment. Someone might want to write about um, Buddhism, Hinduism, you know, and the environment, or just in general, religion and the environment. Um, someone might want to write about the effect on the third world. That's what this, um, those articles are about. Yeah. So is, is, is that okay if I write uh, about, um, pollutions in environment and mentioning the cause, including water pollutions, air well, pollutions, and noise pollutions. Uh, actually, Connie, the final has to have some sort of philosophical, I mean, it's just research if you just do the objective, you know, but it's related to a mentality, right? So why do we have all this? Because we think a certain way, because we use our science to gain power over nature. That's our philosophy. And the Westerners have colonized developing countries and they've colonized their minds and they've colonized their economies. And that's why we keep having this water pollution, this air pollution. Does that make sense, Connie? The research paper is just about focusing on a topic and getting the facts, but it doesn't necessarily ask you why. Whereas the environmental ethic is focused on why, how does all this stuff fit together? Um, 
So you could write your paper on. I, I, Go ahead. Yeah, no, you can go ahead and I'll say. Okay, well, you could write on Francis Bacon set this paradigm. Knowledge is power. And the purpose of knowledge gained power over nature. And you could just say, we cannot get out of this paradigm. We're still in the paradigm. And the evidence of that is air pollution. It keeps getting worse and nobody does anything. Water pollution, right? So I, I think you'd have Bacon and you'd have that view of rationality in Locke and you'd use a few more articles. We had, what does, uh, what does posterity, why do I care about posterity and what it means to be rational? We had, I think I gave you at least half a dozen articles. So that notion of rationality is the cause behind why we have these problems and they're obvious problems and we don't do anything about it because of this cultural system. Does that make sense, Kanich? Uh, so what, what, what do you say first, which article? Well, there's Francis Bacon. Which article? Oh yeah, bacon, bacon, yeah, okay. Yeah, and there was John okay. Locke's view of property. And then there was, what has posterity done for me? He uses the notion of rationality. And then there's a number of articles oh, later yeah. on about our economic system and the way it, it honors somebody for being rational, which means creating wealth, like Sauda said, greed, but that's valued. Um, and that's why we just ignore environmental problems. Um, do you remember Sauda said previously she's been writing about the science, right, Sauda? But in this class, you write about culture. And we are creatures of culture. People can tell each other stories about God or the meaning of life, and they can absolutely detach themselves from the physical world. Uh, whereas you know, when Saud is doing her research, the natural response is, well, why don't we stop this? But the reason is because we had this other view of virtue and vice and God and all this stuff. And we're still functioning on that old view as a culture. Does that make sense to you, Sauda? Yes, Professor. That's what I am looking into about in the papers okay so conage your the environment the paper has to be something about your worldview right which is about culture how do you tie everything together and and i mean if you're if you can't believe all this pollution you have to go back and say um this is the paradigm and that's why we have all this pollution and then you could say and that's why the main point of my environmental ethic is to change the way i think about everything or to educate children or something like that does that make sense Kanich? <laughs> yeah can, can you repeat that again well, you said you want to write about water pollution or air pollution, but you want to, I'm telling you, you have to write about how do you want to look at the world so that you'll stop polluting the air, stop polluting water, right? Yeah. But if, why do people, okay. Bacon looks at the world this way. John Locke looks at the world this way. Robert Heilbrunner looks at the world this way. The guy on value added, and I mean, you just go back and read over those articles. Value added article. Um, all those other articles, lots of articles, advertisers, look at the world this way. That's why we have all the pollution. We just use all our intellectual resources to exploit nature, to gain power, to gain money, to gain status. That's why we have it. Now, what is your environmental ethic? How are you gonna frame some worldview to make it stop?
Yeah, got it. Okay. I mean, would you like to say a Muslim? As a Muslim, I think we ought to make it stop because the Quran says this or Muhammad says that, right? That would be one environmental ethic. Um, but you can invent your own. I just, that's what the paper's about. Is that okay? I mean, I know people, and you could tell them the knowledge about water pollution, air pollution, and they won't care at all. <laughs> They'll say, well, God will change it if God wants to. Or other people will say, well, that's because women are, have sinned and they go to school and they don't get married and they don't take care of kids. And they get divorced and they, they don't cover their bodies. And so God is going to destroy us because women have become so evil. I mean, people believe all sorts of stuff, God. <laughs> uh, and so that's why, you know, I told you why, you know, all these smart people just keep polluting the earth because of that paradigm. Now you tell me what, you, what your environmental ethic is. I think, uh, as you say right now, that people use all the necessary things to get money, um, to get power, to get property, and all that stuff. But we we indirectly use all things, but we're also killing our natures. Like we 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 devastating our uh, good condition of natures. So my environment ethics is if we all becomes. Um, a little bit, you know, you know, what does it call? Care, like a responsible person to the environment. Then I think we can, we, we cannot have all that stuff like water pollutions, environment pollutions, air pollutions, and, and, and whatever. So all this needs is to people to be careful about environment and they should have responsibility. Like they should, uh, they should obey their duty as human because human is the best creations of God. So instead of uh, throwing dust into here and there, we, we we should put dust in the dustbin. We, we should make sweat, and also we should not do anything that makes air pollution. And also. Uh, you know, we, we should give each other chance to develop uh, the environment. So this, if we all uh, plant more tree together before we cut other tree, then I think um, it will be really good. Okay, so, so I think this, all the steps are including responsibility. Right. So instead of just a laundry list, you could say, um, so the title of your paper could be uh, can, let's see, developing practical wisdom in the 21st century. And so this is my paradigm for what it means to be wise. And that includes the way you live uh, sustainably. And then you can mention all that stuff, right? But tie it into some view of wisdom in the 21st century or something like that. Right? And you could also say you're a woman, you're a college educated woman. So in the past, there women weren't. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, title is Developing Practicing Wisdom in, in 20th, 20th Century. Yeah, yeah, that's, that, that's, that's really awesome. And that is exactly what I was talking about. Yeah. Thank you. So it's either practicing wisdom or developing practical wisdom. Yeah. Okay. I'm glad that makes sense to you. And you can say that, yeah, Aristotle had a lot of these virtues, but I'm a woman in Bangladesh going to college. Sorry, Aristotle, you know, you're no Greek man. Like in the 21st century, we can yeah. 
Okay, so that's great. That's that's what I'm looking for. Okay. Oh, yeah, thanks. Okay, so, all right, guys. It took a lot longer than I thought. <laughs> we only had five or six students in and out. And we... Sorry, Professor. <laughs> no, that's probably my fault. <laughs> no, no, I hope you don't you mind. No, no, I talked so much. I hope you don't mind, though, because I don't know if you were eager. Oh, I'll be just an hour. It's okay. Okay, I, I think you hung you hung in there. Uh, I talk a lot, it's probably my fault. No, it's totally fine, Professor. It was a pleasure to hear you. Um, professor, I uh, you have some minutes, so I just wanted to discuss the topic of my final paper. I don't have an outline, I know, but I actually have a topic in mind I'm going to write about. Okay. So as Kanich has also discussed about it, so I wanted to, I wanted to write about like minimalism, uh, mm -hmm. minimalism like uh, a way to a road to the sustainable lifestyle. So I think this will go perfectly with my my environmental ethics because I was planning to become a minimalist for the rest of my life I think maybe within two years or five years but I am not a minimalist at all but that's why like I'm very looking forward to it after knowing the after diving into the details of it like how a minimalist person can live a sustainable life it is like also environmental friendly and also less waste like what you will worry less you will waste less you will use the nature less so it was it is a really positive it creates a real positive impact on me so i yeah, think you're also not always worried about debt right and yeah like you're not having enough money that's just a huge problem people create stress for themselves i i'm talking as an american i mean it's unbelievable to me that you would put yourself in debt when you have a lot of plenty of money exactly like uh, for me like I also I think whenever I see something I, I need that I don't need anything like for to living a live a decent life but there are things like I buy I want to buy and I want to make money for that but I some sometime later I, I realize that I really don't need these things I just keep buying them or just waiting wasting my money and also this these because of our need, and the greed of people exactly like these um, um, dirty businesses to environment are happening. And that's why I think it will be a good solution if I can really become a minimalist in the future. And so that's why I want to write about it as much. Okay, as so your paper could be my goal, colon, uh, a post-millennial minimalist <laughs> or minimalism in the post-millennium or something like that, right? It's catchy. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> well, that's why I want to leave it totally open to students because they come up with good ideas, but some <laughs> of them just get so freaked out with that. <laughs> because I give them all the responsibility, right? But, you know, if someone's pushing you, you're not going to do it. You're not going to be motivated. So if you can just create something that actually, yes, like I believe in this. Yeah, you just wrote it down. Well, okay, do it. <laughs> oh, thank you, Professor. Okay, well, good luck, guys. Thank you, Professor. Have a good day, good year. Yeah, well, I hope to see you again in class or over on campus or something. Uh, I hope your work goes well the yeah. last week and all that stuff. So yeah, take care. I, I like AUW students. I think they're great. Thank you, Professor. Uh,